This week in H10 EMA, we've been looking at the interaction between charged particles. This includes Coulomb's law, which is the force between these particles measured in newtons, and also then looking at the electrostatic fields that these particles generate. In the rest of the videos this week, we're going to look at solving a past exam question, both in terms of electric fields and then in electric forces. Hopefully this will help you gain the confidence to tackle these types of problems. Remember to have a go at the homework, which won't go live this week, but next week, and have a go at any of the additional problems that are up on Moodle, as well as all the past exam papers. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how we can solve different types of electric field and electric forces problems using the content that we learnt in Lecture 2 of H10 EMA. So there's two main equations to come away with from this lecture. First up, we've got Coulomb's law, which we looked at also in lecture one, and this is the one that's indicated on the left. Here we've got the force is equal to the charges multiplied together divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And if you want a bit of a reminder for your revision, see if you can remember what each of those denotes in that equation. So that is Coulomb's law, and that looks at the force between two charges because we've got two charges in the the equation. On the other side we've got the equation for the electric field strength. This only involves one charge and this is essentially looking at what is happening if we've got a charge here it could be positive or negative. We've got an electric field that radiates away from it because it's a spherical point charge. That's basically saying if I'm located here what is the strength of that electric field that's happening due to the charge Q1 which is in the equation because all of these charges are going to be producing an electric field and that's going to have an influence upon the other charges in the area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve some of the various problems in actually last year's exam paper because it seems like the best way to do it. So what you can see here is this is last year's exam. You can access all of these through the library and they're all available on Moodle for you to look at at your own leisure. So you see you've got two hours and what we're going to do is we're going to answer question one from this exam paper for this seminar. So as you can see, like I said in the lecture, we've got the various constants that you're allowed on the front. So we've got the charge of an electron. We've also got the permittivity of free space. You'll also see there something called the permeability of free space, which relates to magnetic fields. And we'll be looking at that after the midterm exam. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by answering question one. So 1a, question relates to a negative point charge of six microcoulombs, so that's important to remember. We've got to first up sketch the electric field lines around the charge for two marks. Then we're going to calculate the electric field strength. Note it's the electric field, not the electrostatic force. Okay, that's important. Then in part three, we move on to calculating the electrostatic force. So we're going to need to use both of those equations to answer all of this question. So what we're going to do is we're going to give yourself a bit of space and you can do it bigger than you can than I can if you'd like to. And I know this is red. But it's just the default color. I could change it. So it's negative. So I'm just going to show it's negative. And to show the lines, we know the electric field is going to radiate in all directions from this charge because it's a point charge. The clue is in the name. Um, and because it's negative, these lines are going to be pointing inwards. So you should have you'd get one mark for showing that they're uniformly distributed and one mark for showing that they're pointing inwards. So that's two marks. One, two. Um, next up, let's calculate using the equation over here what the electric field strength is at a distance of 10 millimetres away from it. So what information do we have? And you, if you want to draw over your exam paper and highlight things, that's absolutely fine. What we need is using that equation, we can say that E is equal to 6 times 10 to the minus 6 because it's 6 micro coulombs over 4 pi epsilon naught, which is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12, which I've just taken from the front of the exam paper, multiplied by the radius squared. And in this, when we say radius, it's because these are all relating to circles. But essentially, that radius refers to the distance between the center of those charges. So this is 10 times 10 to the minus 3, because it's millimeters. 
and then remember to square that. Next step is to actually do that calculation and that should then give you an answer of 5 times 10 to the 8 volts per meter. Um, you may have previous written volts per meter like this, so V slash M. Um, it's better scientific notation if you can actually do the superscript. It's just good practice there. Um, remember to use your units in all of my EMA exams. If you fail to give the correct unit, you will lose half a mark. I won't end up giving you negative marks, but if you've got the answer right and the, and the unit's wrong, then you'll lose that half a mark. Next up, we're going to do uh, part three. So an electron is placed 10 millimetres away from the charge. What is the magnitude and direction of the electrostatic force between the charges? What we need to do for this equation now is we're no lo longer going to be using this equation for electric field strength. We're now going to be using Coulomb's law to show this. So we know this is F is equal to Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. So let's see what we've got. Well, we need to find the force. That's the answer we're looking for. We know what Q1 is because we know that this is 6 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. That was given in the first part of the question. Now we're going to introduce an electron into there. So let's add in the magnitude of the charge of the electron, which we can get off the front of our exam paper. So that's 1 times 6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And now we can put in the rest of the information. So 4 pi epsilon naught, once again, off the front of the exam paper, 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12. That's actually in farads per metre if you're interested, but that's not too relevant for now. And now we're going to put in the distance. And this was given in the question as being 10 millimetres once again. So that's 10 times 10 to the minus 3. And please, please, please remember to square that common mistake students make in exams. So let's calculate that. If you use your calculator, you'll get an answer of 8.6 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons. Again, remember the units, otherwise you will lose your marks. And so um, finally, remember to answer. This is the magnitude. We've done the difficult bit. Now we need to say the direction to get the full marks. And this time, because they're both negative charges, these charges will be repelling. So if you just state um, charges will be repelling or words to that effect, charges will repel, then you will get the mark. Now we're going to look at part B. This is... Um, you see this wording, it's a system of three charges in a line in free space. This allows us to make quite a lot of simplifications to our calculation. So you're asked to calculate the force on charge Q1 due to charges Q2 and Q3 and to state the magnitude and the direction. What we do to solve these types of problems is we split it up into smaller pieces we can calculate the force between two charges. We've already done that and most students find this fairly straightforward. What we now need to do is to break it up into those small pieces. So we're going to calculate the force on charge Q1 due to charge Q2 and imagine that Q3 doesn't even exist. Then once we've done that, we're going to calculate the force on Q1 due to Q3 and pretend that Q2 doesn't exist. When we've got those two intermediate answers, we then can combine them to get our final answer. And this is worth eight marks. So I've just ported that image across onto my screen so it's just a bit easier for me to work with. Remember, you'll have a slightly different format if you're writing on a piece of paper. Your life is a lot easier. So first up, let's calculate um, Q1. So the force on Q1 due to... Uh, Q2 and you can call it whatever you want you can call it F2 because it's due to Q2 I'm going to call this F12 uh, because it's the force on Q1 due to charge 2 and that is equal to remember Coulomb's law so this is going to be Q1 because we're interested in Q1 and Q2 because we're also interested in Q2 divided by 4 pi epsilon naught because those are constant. Normally we'd have r squared here but what we're going to do is because r is just the distance between those charges we're going to look at our situation and we can see between 
the centre of Q1 and the centre of Q2, that's actually A, which is indicated in the question. So I'm just going to write A squared. That's not a small Q. It's just my writing is a bit messy. So now you've done that. Let's put some numbers in and get an answer. So this is given in the blurb below the diagram in the question. So Q1 is 5 times 10 to the minus 6. And Q2 is also 5 times 10 to the minus 6. It doesn't matter that they've got different charges at the moment. We are purely interested in the magnitude to calculate this magnitude. Then we've got 4 pi. I'm not going to write out 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 because you know it. Multiplied by A squared. Well, this is actually given as... Um, one centimeter so I'm just going to put that straight in without doing my superscripts so 0 0.01 sorry 0 0.1 squared which is yeah one centimeter if you do that your final answer well sorry your intermediate answer will be a large number so this is actually uh, 2246.94 newtons and it's worth noting that because these are opposite charges, they will attract. So it's an attractive force. So because we're interested in what's happening at Q1 due to Q2, we're going to say that that force is actually acting towards Q2. So I'm just going to indicate that there on my diagram. So um, just you can say it's acting to the right or just um, add a diagram. Either is absolutely fine. So that's the first section sorted. Now we're going to look at what's happening. We're going to calculate the force on charge Q1 due to Q3. So that's why I've called it F13. It doesn't matter what you call it. So we're going to pretend that, we're going to pretend for the sake of our model, we're going to pretend that Q2 doesn't exist. So I've just wiped that out. So once again, it's Coulomb's law. So let's add it in. So we're interested in charge Q1. This time, the second charge we're interested in isn't Q2, it's Q3. That's all divided by 4 pi, epsilon naught. And normally we'd have R in this one, but that's just simply the distance between the charges. So here we go, it's this long length here, which we can see is actually A plus B. So you can put that straight in or you can write A plus B squared into your equation. So now we've set that all up, let's put some numbers in. So uh, Q1 is still 5 microcoulombs and Q2 is this time it's 15 microcoulombs. So it's 15 times 10 to the minus 6. I'll stick some brackets in just to keep it nice and tidy. All over 4 pi times epsilon naught times a plus b which is actually six centimeters so I'm just going to put that in in meter form and then please remember to square that as well common mistake and when you do that calculation what you will get is an answer which is much smaller so it's 187.25 newtons now and what direction is this acting in well q1 and q3 are like charges so what's going to happen is they're going to be repelling so this is going to be acting to the left so f13 and you can either write to the left or draw an arrow on a diagram either is fine so now we've got two intermediate answers our final answer is going to be the vector sum of f12 and f13 one, three, because Q1 is affected by both of those forces. So by looking at this, um, we can, I'll draw this in. So I've got F12 and F13. However, you just look at this and you say, well, which one's bigger? And in this case, from our calculation, we know that F12 is much bigger. So overall, F12 is going to win out and the charge is going to move, the force is going to act to the right. So to calculate the magnitude, we can say that F overall is equal to F12 minus the influence of F13. You can put those numbers in, and then you will get around about 2059.7 newtons acting to the right.
the right. Um, if you had two forces acting in the same direction, you would add them together. This is just a case of stepping back, looking at your answer and figuring out what directions those forces are acting in. You can do these types of problems looking at the influence of different charges. So some of the answers, some of the questions will say what's happening to Q2 due to Q1 and Q3. You can look at it in any order you want. The process is actually the same. You remove one of the charges, calculate it, remove the other charge, calculate um, the intermediate answer again, and then step back and look at the final solution. It doesn't matter how many charges you have in a line, you can actually do this procedure of simplification and then combining it together at the end to get your answer. You can also do this type of problem when you're looking at the influence of electric fields from more than two charges in a line, and the procedure is exactly the same, and we've been through this in class.